Hi, this is the uh, second lecture uh, in the module on strategies and materials uh, for surface repair. Uh, and in the first lecture, we looked at uh, root cause analysis and repair strategies. And in this lecture, we will be looking at how to select a repair material, looking at various material, pro various uh, f type of forces that will act and or what are the requirements of a repair material. Uh, and then based on those uh, inputs, we select the repair material. And then in the next lecture, we will look at compatibility of the repair material with substrate. So, uh, first uh, this selection, uh, the process itself is very complex uh, because you have to look at various things, uh, what happens uh, during the repair activity, what happens after the repair is done. Uh, and so, we have to come up with some uh, criteria for uh, you know selecting the repair materials. Uh, first thing to look at is what are the requirements set by the owners and engineers or the pe people who actually uh, build or construct and then what are the in service and exposure uh, in service and exposure conditions and uh, also what technique you will be uh, adopt to uh, apply the repair material. Uh, so, all these have to be uh, looked at and uh, corresponding criteria have to be framed uh, while preparing tender documents for the uh, you know selection of repair materials. And also we have to look at loading conditions on the repair and substrate materials. If you are talking about a repair material for a bridge as opposed to uh, a repair material for uh, a house uh, or a you know building. There are two different, uh, you know, uh, the conditions could be very, very different. And also, for example, in the case of bridge, you might have an additional uh, feature which is essentially looking at the uh, you know, vibration uh, or the uh, you know, load induced vibrations uh, on the repair and substrate material. So, all these are uh, very important. And then uh, we also uh, look at uh, have to look at the dimensional changes of repair materials and substrate materials, basically looking at the shrinkage, creep, and other uh, characteristics. And then uh, cured and uncured state, uh, how the uh, you know repair material will behave uh, in the early ages of application or after the application, and once the uh, you know uh, material has cured and then uh, how the moisture condition, temperature, uh, creep, shrinkage etcetera or how the material will behave under these uh, various uh, conditions. And then finally, after looking at all these performance requirements and looking at uh, you know comparing properties of uh, different materials, we have to really look at uh, you know the cost cost is also very important and how they perform in the long term, not short term, but long term because that is a whole uh, game. We have to uh, be uh, you know good enough to select uh, materials which will actually perform uh, good in long term, not just for a couple of years after repair. So, this is all uh, very important uh, and this, this is the reason why uh, we think it is actually the selection process itself is uh, very complex. Now, how do we streamline this? You know, uh, you know, you have to have a set of uh, set procedures. Uh, you know, to come up uh, to simplify this process of uh, material selection. First, let's look at some of the questions which you can ask uh, while during the analysis of uh, you know uh, various strategies available. And so, for how do you do that? You know, first, what are the user performance requirements? And then, these are some seven questions. I'm going to show you a little bit more details on these questions in the next three slides. And then, what are the load carrying requirements? What will be the exposure conditions or in-service exposure condi conditions? And what will be the operating condition during placement and curing? That is early, right? Just during the uh, construction and what placement technique can be chosen and what are the characteristics uh, required for placement 
and then has the original cause of deterioration been addressed that is very important to uh, look at because if you are just let us say something went wrong in a structure and you are repairing with the same old materials uh, without really uh, thinking about the root cause and then uh, just doing some repair then uh, the uh, you know answer to the last question would be no and which is again going to be a problem uh, later on. So, let us look at a little bit more detail first question I told in the previous slide was uh, what are the user performance requirement. So, look at here uh, as a user you know it is not necessary that user is always a civil engineer. So, you know there, there could be anybody. So, uh, what is the appearance you know for example, non civil engineers or in particular non material engineer or non concrete technologist uh, they would uh, worry about appearance significantly. So, uh, maybe you will have to make sure that the repair itself is hidden or not visible sometimes uh, the people may agree okay it's okay it's fine to be visible and maybe crack free surface structure so these are different things uh, which could vary from user to user but we uh, when we think about selecting repair materials we should think about how to uh, think about you know putting all these things in perspective uh, so that the end product or the repair at the end is actually meeting the requirement of the user. So, user is the key term here and uh, how will be how will the repair work interfere with the use of the structure. In other words uh, after the repair will the structure be able to uh, will the uh, let us say you are talking about a uh, building and where you have a beam and then if you want to repair something uh, you know let us say increase the capacity of the beam or something then. Uh, if you are saying I am going to put a column at the center then maybe it will still function but sorry function the repair will work, but that is not necessary uh, you know that will actually interfere with the use of the structure. So, that is something which we have to think the functionality cannot be changed or I mean it should not be affected. Uh, so, again uh, what example I just told was of a structural repair, but similar things uh, can be thought also for repair materials. You know for example, if I am talking uh, let us say there is a repair material uh, which uh, if it is uh, you know releasing toxic gases because why I am saying this we have I have been to a, a building where they use some uh, repair material which was injected into the uh, you know wall and then uh, it was not uh, you know people were not able to sit in the room for 2 to 3 months because there are a lot of this toxic elements you know from the uh, uh, repair material was coming into the room and it was not uh, uh, you know possible to sit in that room. So, you have to think about what are you doing it for and is it going to affect the end user ok. So, that that is not a good repair if it is going to affect the end user in an adverse manner and also we have to look at the turnaround time how much how long the repair will take. So, you go to a site do the work and then get out of the site. So, what is that that is what is turnaround time. So, how long it takes to complete and transfer the site to uh, the uh, user uh, for uh, you know using. Now, what is the expected life in other words durability is it the is it that you want to repair this and then you expect that you can every 5 years you can actually afford to go and repair again or you want no more repair and one time and uh, get it done in a good way uh, at first time itself. So, that uh, you know we can really say it is a long uh, or durable repair. So, that means looking at the maintenance interval how frequent you can actually go and maintain if it is an important structure and then where you do not really want to interfere with the functionality maybe the maintenance in interval should be kept as very long and what is the tolerance for a repair failure means uh, if the repair fails is it really going to affect the structure significantly or the user significantly or you know some questions like that. So, these type of questions should be asked uh, before we select uh, you know a repair material. So, th this all information should be there before selecting uh, repair material. Now, 
we also have to look at what are the load carrying requirements in the previous slide we looked at what the user requires now here uh, it's more of a structural uh, you know phenomenon where you you know uh, what type of loads will come or you need to know what type of loads will be acting uh, on the repair. So, we have to look at what is a dead load, live load and that is mechanical load and then also service and exposure condition which is essentially environmental loading. So, what type of uh, at immediate atmosphere is there for the concrete structure? For example, if I am talking about a chemical plant then definitely this gas this condition is going to be very very important if you are talking about an ammonia plant or any any chemical for that matter you have to see what that repair material will be exposed to uh, you know uh, that is something very important and uh, again chemicals are they going to be in direct contact if you are talking about uh, uh, again a chemical plant where uh, uh, you know you might spill chemical on floor. Uh, which is usually the case in case of uh, food industry or you know any chemical industry for that matter there will be a lot of toxic which will be uh, you know uh, thrown onto the uh, ground and then you might have some concrete elements also there. So, all these things we have to look at and if you are talking about external exposure UV exposure is something which is important and what moisture condition and temperature conditions and uh, if there is any external loading. Uh, coming then we have to also consider those in that particularly you know you can think about all these again this external both mechanical and uh, chemical or environmental loading uh, are included ok. So, this uh, load carrying requirements and or basically mechanical and environmental conditions have to be assessed and then what about the conditions during placement and curing that means in the early time and then what about the placement techniques what type of techniques should be adopted to place the repair material and then also looking at geometry configurations. What will be the operating conditions? So, for example, access or you know wind what is the velocity is there any heavy wind conditions and then if you are looking at temperature what is the temperature which the concrete substrate is exposed to or experiencing and what about the immediate environment and is there any uh, the significant temperature differential uh, and then if you are talking about moisture again looking at the moisture condition on the substrate and on the ambient air and turnaround time I already discussed in the previous slide and then loading if you are talking about a bridge definitely vibration is something which is very important to uh, look at uh, because you know if you are constructing let us say you have to imagine a case where you are uh, actually uh, uh, repairing a bridge structure uh, while the traffic is uh, on in that case there will be significant vibration and in most uh, sometimes you may not be able to even stop the traffic. So, yeah, at least one lane will be going on. So, they, that can induce significant vibration which will dislodge or you know uh, debond the repair material from the substrate. So, these conditions must be looked at. So, what we will have to do in such case may be uh, a material which will get bonded very well as a you know at a very fast and uh, in such cases or in other words before the vibrator uh, vibratory loads come. Uh, you will have to ensure that the bond strength is significantly uh, high. Now, what is the chosen placement technique? So, if you are different thing you can place it by hand, you can place it by using a pump. So, different techniques uh, we have to look at uh, what is the chosen placement technique. Now, what characteristics are required for placement? If I am talking about placing uh, repair material, let us say you want to use SCC for placing uh, repair material in a concrete beam which is you know uh, let us say you have you are repairing an auditorium for example, if you have a beam uh, right in the middle of the auditorium which is not really easily reachable or even a, a girder of a bridge which is also not re easy to reach. So, you will uh, sometimes use a concrete pump and uh, if uh, you are using pump uh, even for repair motor if you are using a pump then what are the characteristics of the motor which is essential to be able to pump that motor. So, segregation resistance, 
uh, that is very very important you have to be able to handle the viscosity have a low viscosity. So, it is not uh, uh, you know all these have to be really thought through different material properties for that particular application. So, for a for example, flowability and it should not sag in first state especially and set time uh, should be reasonable you do not want to wait for too long. And uh, another thing is what is the geometric configuration of repair exposed surface area if it is too much or very large surface area then you have to think about the moisture loss from the uh, repair material or uh, you will have to have uh, you know uh, the shrinkage could be high in such cases. So, all that have to be again thought through so, thickness of the repair how thick that repair element is if it is too thin then there may be a high chance of shrinkage and in, uh, such cracks. So, you have to have sufficient thickness uh, and then or design the material even if it is uh, very thin uh, design the material in a way that uh, even if it is very thin it will not uh, crack and size of the uh, exposed reinforcing bar spacing of the reinforcing bar and clear clearance between reinforcing bars and uh, substrate that is basically the uh, undercutting which you are talking about and then clearance between reinforcing bar and exposed surface that is basically the amount of new uh, repair material uh, bit which is going to be uh, you know covering the reinforcement. So, these uh, different uh, aspects uh, are you know very very important uh, which need to be really thought through before selecting. I would I just remembered one thing I would like to say that there is a practice nowadays that we let the material suppliers to tell us what we what may type of material we should use. I think that is something which is uh, not at all a good uh, thing as engineers we should be able to think through what the material will uh, experience what type of stresses and uh, you know environmental conditions or exposure conditions the material will be exposed to and uh, we should know in such environmental conditions or stru structural condi loading conditions what are the properties that are very crucial for the material uh, to resist uh, you know uh, damage during those ex damage and deterioration in such cases and as engineers we should be telling that I want this material and this material should have these 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 properties and be able to uh, you know uh, tell uh, measurable parameters or set limits with measurable parameters you know it is not always good to say something should be high low and all that you should be able to come up with a specific range uh, of uh, you know values for the uh, parameters. For example, if I am talking shrinkage resistance I want something which is very good or having high resistance against shrinkage I should be able to say what is the upper limit and lower limit or you know in quantitative terms we cannot just simply say it should be highly resistant against shrinkage high for me may not be high for somebody else. So, you have to be able to give objective uh, specifications in the contracts very clearly when you should say uh, what are the upper and lower limits and if you are saying the upper and lower limit you should or uh, you have to really think through the problem then only you will be able to say. So, in that case you will really learn about the subject and uh, then uh, you know engineers will be able to dictate what is required uh, to the supplier and then they provide that uh, supplier rather than letting the suppliers decide on what is uh, required. Now, uh, material selection process one more questions for repair strategy ok. Three questions main things it is again in similar lines with what we already discussed, but put it in a slightly different uh, way because here we are talking about the strategy. So, what properties are required to meet the conditions and requirement this is exactly what I just mentioned you know we uh, should be able to engineer should be able to uh, decide on the properties and their magnitude to meet the condition requirement. I am just going to write here and and the magnitude or you know upper and lower limits upper and lower limits 
and also another thing which is very important is when we say these properties they should be measurable parameters okay measurable parameters because uh, whatever we say this you know uh, it, it's you know, when if it is a loose term then it's easy for anybody to interpret in a different way and then uh, you know you, the end result is not always as expected so when you put you know things as black and white i want to measure this property or this parameter and then these are the numbers the uh, you know the observed result should be between this and this so things are very clear and so when you set a demand to the supplier or the manufacturer they will actually meet the requirements you know most of the time we don't tell exactly what we need so then they just try to sell what they have and uh, so this is again systems will uh, you know what materials or systems will provide uh, the requirement so this is again part of the selection and how to choose materials and system with optimum cost performance risk and especially when i say performance long term performance is something very very uh, important now level of influence uh, you know if you are talking about different service or exposure conditions like i said uh, exposure to the sunlight you can think about uv exposure if it is exposed to chemicals like gases or liquid especially it's very important when we talk about either a pipeline or a chemical plant where uh, you know the concrete elements might get exposed to uh, uh, you know different gases uh, or a liquid and temperature depending on whether it is an outdoor environment or an indoor environment or if it is a uh, you know a factory where local temperature conditions are uh, slightly different from the ambient environment conditions and then of course the structural uh, loading is also very very important now here you can look at the picture here uh, if uh, surface defects are very uh, important to handle then you can provide a surface coating and then so that is let's say level 1 and then the repair material effects if you are talking about this black arrow here which is again talking about the uh, the repair material itself and if you are talking about the reinforcement effects the corrosion of the reinforcement uh, then uh, something can be done at that uh, re interface between the reinforcement and the steel and also interface between the repair material and the substrate that is the red arrow showing this th this region here so that's essentially looking at the bond between the repair material and the substrate and also looking at the effect of uh, substrate itself uh, you know whether that is itself is still shrinking or expanding or whatever whatever damage happens to the substrate itself so these are different uh, you know exposure conditions and how they will influence different strategies adopted or different uh, systems adopted for uh, repair so these are the uh, different systems uh, that is shown in the sketch. Now for the load carrying uh, properties bond to substrate seems to be very very important as you see in the picture at the bottom you can see that there are substrate here and then repair material here if the repair material shrinks definitely there is a, a significant shear stress acting between the uh, substrate and the repair material and it will shrink and then uh, if there is no uh, other mechanical interlocking effect it will just easily uh, come out uh, uh, you know and flake off from the substrate and it will delaminate and uh, detachment of the repair from the substrate so both the same thing so that will uh, that is not something which is uh, expected so if you want to prevent this type of failure what are the properties you have to look for make sure that there is a good tensile bond because if the tensile bond is very good it will not move in this direction this direction the movement in that direction will not happen and also keep the internal stresses low that means here the internal stress is mainly well, let us say one example could be shrinkage okay so if we can have the repair material which has a very uh, high resistance against the shrinkage then the shrinkage stresses will be very low so the uh, effectively you will not have this kind of uh, problem so again the fourth column here this one it's essentially you know saying what are the look uh, the, what are the things that we should look for to avoid this type of problem 
So, high internal stress caused by thermal incompatibility should be avoided and drying shrinkage should be avoided. That means, this material should have high resistance against the shrinkage and high resistance against the uh, therm, uh, you know uh, volume changes due to thermal effects. Now, uh, same thing continuing load carrying capacity as intended by the engineer and then the question is uh, result what will happen if the mat uh, material if a wrong material uh, is selected and what, what happens in this picture as it is shown on the bottom. You can see that there is a dissimilar uh, deformation means in this particular case the this uh, a plate and this is another plate. If the top and bottom if the entire column is deforming to the same level uh, that is what I marked here as similar deformation then what we can say is that either the stress experienced by uh, depending on the stress strain behavior of the two materials. So, let us say you have uh, two materials here a stress strain behavior is something like this okay. and if they have similar deformation we can for example, assume that you know it is something like this if it is strain and if it is the stress, stress strain graph. If they have similar deformation and uh, of course, you know we are uh, talking about the uh, entire uh, structure here, but still uh, for the understanding purpose we can say uh, if when I say similar deformation I am going to assume it as same strain level uh, and then what I can see here is two materials will be actually experiencing different stress. Okay. So, that means uh, at the same loading condition two materials will experience different stress and one might be still in its elastic region while the other is already started uh, cracking and all that. So, this is something which we have to uh, think about making sure that the uh, uh, either the repair material or the substrate they do not really get into the uh, both of them should be kept within the uh, elastic uh, range. And so, that way we can actually avoid this significant uh, increase in the sh uh, shear between the materials also. Anyway, point is uh, we both repair and uh, you know substrate should be uh, maintained within that elastic limit the stress applied for both should be within the elastic limit. And if the uh, you know like in the previous one we showed that there is a stiff plate on the uh, top and bottom. Well, in this case if the support is if the top and bottom is not very stiff and uh, then what will happen is uh, there is a dissimilar deformation in the substrate and the uh, repair material or the two materials. And in such case if I redraw that graph if it is let us say you have two materials which are having uh, different uh, stress strain behavior. So, if it is a dissimilar deformation that means probably at the same load you might have something like this at the same load condition you will have different strains experienced by the two different uh, materials systems. Now, that also might when I say two different strain level that means that there could be some uh, shear stress developed uh, between uh, the two materials and which can also uh, create problems and this main reason could be uh, actually due to the uh, creep effects. And uh, over a period of time the repair material can relax under creep deformation. Now, uh, what should we look for? We should look for extremely low compression creep that means the deformation will be very minimal. Uh, so, that still both the materials will have similar uh, you know strain. So, high compression creep should be avoided we have to get a ma uh, use materials uh, which have which are very resistant against the creep deformation. Now, this is an example again uh, we looked at the drying shrinkage in the previous slides you know if the drying shrinkage is significant eventually there is that means there is a significant reduction in the volume of the repair material and which will eventually leads to the uh, loss of contact between the repair material and the uh, substrate which essentially reduces the ability to carry uh, compressive load. Imagine this case here where the load is coming from the top down and then 
if the if there is a disjoint like this shown here okay if that uh, the repair material is shrinking if it is not uh, then it is not able to transfer the load from top to bottom so that is not something which is desirable so the repair material should be able to transfer the load so uh, we can provide a, a, a rebar so in other words modify the system so that the rebar uh, you know by modify the system by introducing a rebar which then will help in preventing the uh, you know uh, uh, which will help in uh, transferring the load directly from top to bottom uh, through the repair material region. So, how do we select when we have a problems like this make sure that drying shrinkage is very low. Okay. And uh, if you are talking about therm temperature changes again shrinkage stresses can happen if there is temperature is going to decrease then it is going to have it is going to shrink any material in general will shrink and that can lead to uh, sh uh, cracks like this shown here the repair material itself uh, cracks and in the previous picture it was clear here in this bottom right you can see that that material is cracking that is mainly because there is a shrinkage under restraint and here the restraint is provided by this this surface here and so half of the material is shrinking to one side the another half is shrinking to the other side leaving a crack right at the uh, center. Now, how do we prevent uh, you get materials which are having equal coefficient of thermal expansion as compared to that of uh, or coefficient as coefficient of thermal expansion of the repair material and that of the concrete substrate should be similar then you will not have any uh, issues uh, like this. Now, if uh, temperature changes again if that we are talking about increase in temperature here in the previous slide we were talking about decrease in temperature here when temperature is increasing the repair material might expand and this expansion will induce uh, you know stresses onto the surrounding substrate and when it reaches a point where substrate cannot take any more uh, you know that compressive load uh, compressive stress which is coming from this. So, what will happen it will pop out okay? it will pop out and then the concrete will uh, again get uh, damaged. Now, again same uh, theory as same uh, tip can be used uh, that is uh, mainly go for a material which has similar coefficient of thermal expansion as compared to uh, the substrate. Now, uh, here we are talking about repair temperature changes in repair material during placement. Okay. In the previous two slides we were talking about after the placement even during placement this can happen if the temperature is decreasing the material will shrink uh, again uh, how can we handle that because uh, use a low exotherm during placement and curing that means the heat uh, the uh, rate of release of heat should be low and that will help in uh, keeping the material uh, you know or help in preventing the material from uh, cracking. And we had discussed this also uh, you know in the earlier slides on thermal cracking etcetera. So, we want uh, the repair material to react and or hydrate slowly without releasing much heat in the very beginning. So, slow and steady wins the race. So, uh, this is the idea uh, you know strategy here is to use materials which release less heat. Now, uh, atmospheric gases and exposure to uh, moisture. Let us say talking about uh, you know a power plant or uh, sorry uh, any uh, chemical uh, plants where uh, gases uh, you know present in the near surface of the concrete uh, could actually uh, lead to uh, corrosion and also moisture condition if it is very wet for example, if you are talking about a power plant where you might have in the cooling tower you use salt water and always the structure is entirely in uh, you know wet condition. So, uh, you know this has to be looked at and very important and how we handle such case because we know at the time of construction itself we know that 
uh, the uh, exposure condition is going to be like this. There will be moisture and salt water is going to be used uh, in the cooling tower. So, or you know whatever the chemical uh, you know plant. So, we know what the exposure conditions are going to be and we have to prevent those elements like moisture and uh, uh, these chemicals from entering into the concrete. So, how we have to go for a low permeability uh, concrete especially at the surface you cannot allow the concrete to enter okay? or uh, even there should be no cracks. Uh, but main thing is have a concrete which is uh, highly impermeable. It is not the strength always that matters when we talk about uh, durability. We already discussed it, but I want to emphasize that you know even today many people uh, they just uh, talk about when you talk about concrete they talk about uh, M something and what I am thinking is we should start uh, thinking about you know M if it is M X and then we should be moving from here to M X D Y or if the D I am thinking like you know this is the strategy which we should have. Let us forget about just talking about M concrete like M 30, M 40 that kind of concrete. We should start thinking about adding at least one durability parameter when we talk about selecting concrete. It is very, very important if you are talking about uh, you know structures which are exposed to severe environmental or exposure conditions. I will tell you one example. I know there are cases where uh, cooling towers are made and then uh, you know uh, this particular example I am talking a cooling tower which is made with about 50 crores uh, of rupees and then within about uh, I think 6 or 7 years uh, going for a repair which again uh, cost about 30 crores. So, that is something uh, you know insane like you know it is too much of uh, money uh, to be spent and at the time of construction it is not that we did not know about durability and corrosion etcetera. So, it is high time that when we talk about especially large infrastructure projects we must start thinking about uh, enforcing durability parameters uh, or enforcing the use of uh, this uh, you know concrete which are uh, which should which can be really uh, give long lasting uh, you know performance. So, uh, again emphasizing it is time for us to start thinking about MXDY concretes not just uh, concrete specified as because most structural engineers still think about FCK alone and that is not something which is advisable to go for in uh, for uh, you know when we talk about long term performance. We must introduce uh, one of the durability parameters. So, which can be then uh, correlated ideally it is diffusion coefficient, but we you cannot really test diffusion coefficient always. So, you can get other parameters which can then be correlated to the diffusion coefficient. Now, UV exposure uh, this is an important uh, you know uh, consideration when we think about repair materials which include a lot of uh, polymers. For example, polymer modified mortar or waterproofing integral waterproofing uh, chemicals if we use those kind of uh, uh, you know materials then definitely uh, the exposure to because sometimes these materials if you are talking about waterproofing in most cases if you are talking about rain water like a you know a water tightness against rain then definitely that element is exposed to the sunlight and over a period of time if that uh, chemical which is the polymer which is inside the uh, concrete if that degrades then it will not have the same function as expected. So, uh, when you talk about uh, you know exterior elements and if you are talking about materials with significant amount of polymers in it, it is uh, uh, we must check the resistance of that material system uh, against UV exposure. So, uh, avoid materials with low UV resistance or go for materials with high UV resistance. Now, chemical contact uh, in factories or even in if you are talking about uh, effluents which is coming from uh, you know factories. So, there will be concrete elements which are 
uh, uh, which get in direct contact with the either the water body or water body which is rich in other uh, chemicals and effluents okay and which will eventually damage the concrete cover re remove the concrete cover and then the steel inside uh, just uh, gets exposed and then start corroding again here also the idea is go for low permeability uh, uh, low permeability or highly impermeable uh, concrete cover and also look at the chemical resistance of the uh, you know uh, concrete cover which we in in depth we discussed in the uh, previous slides on uh, sulfate attack and etc where we were looking at uh, chemical resistance of the concrete and we also discussed uh, about freeze thaw and here looking at moisture conditions and saturation and uh, main uh, the damage mechanism here is freeze thaw and uh, that can disintegrate these uh, concrete layer by layer by layer which over a period of time uh, you know uh, can remove sig or degrade significant amount of cover concrete as you see in the uh, photograph here. Again how to handle this go for a low permeability uh, concrete or highly impermeable uh, concrete. Now uh, let us look at uh, structure or systems where you have moving liquids let us say like pop, uh, you know water pipelines or if you have moving liquids and suspended solid like it happens in hydraulic structures or dams as you see in the picture here the top left I have shown a picture of a concrete pipeline uh, and in the bottom right I am showing a picture where uh, the dam spillway you can see significant erosion at the bottom where you know if, if there is let us say you have uh, heavy rain uh, or something and then uh, the uh, depending on how much uh, you know suspended particles are there in the water uh, you can have uh, if there is a lot of suspended particle then there is a, a significant damage can happen. Uh, to the concrete surfaces uh, especially in hydraulic structures. So, how do we handle this uh, high density concrete, high compressive strength and high tensile strength. So, in the both these cases that is the strategy. So, here also density, compressive strength and tensile strength. So, basically the concrete should be very dense and at the same time the strength properties also should be uh, very good because it is essentially to deal with uh, liquid uh, you know liquid and suspended particles abrading uh, you know erosion and abrasion of surfaces. So, this is and more detail on this were uh, covered in the you know lecture on uh, exclusive lecture on this thing uh, which is on uh, you know erosion and abrasion. Now, abrasion when we talk about wheels on road structures or even warehouses where you will have heavy equipment movement on the concrete surface and uh, because of the heavy load and traction you can sig uh, experience significant abrasion damage to the concrete surface. You see here in this picture you can see this portion is slightly getting damaged and this significant uh, loss in the other portion of the concrete which is shown here again go for high density and high compressive strength. So, density and compressive strength uh, are the key for uh, you know ensuring that this kind of damage does not happen and at the same time we can uh, the in the uh, detail lecture uh, on this we discuss that there are many other things also which we look at where basically we look at uh, the size of the aggregate and the uh, strength and how much is the paste content uh, different things we looked at and uh, it, it is possible and also looking at you know smoothness of the surface especially when you talk about erosion or cavitation. So, all this have been discussed in detail and I will request you to actually when you uh, look at one PPT if there is any connecting images or principles please go back and then look at the other uh, videos also uh, that will help you to really understand the science behind and then be able uh, be a better engineer. Uh, and then if you are talking about impact load, this is an example uh, where uh, you can see very clearly on the right side this bitumen surface is the approach road for a bridge and uh, this is on the left side is the bridge. So, this is the approach road and this is the bridge. 
and then you can see very clearly significant uh, cracking at that particular expansion joint there and under this picture also you can see that there is an expansion joint and significant cracking along the expansion joint. Why this is happening? Mainly because the uh, material which is used is a very uh, brittle material. So, or in other words the toughness of the material is not very high. In this particular case if we if they were using a fiber reinforced concrete or, uh, for example, they would uh, this this much cracking would not have happened. So, you have to really look at how much energy the material can absorb or toughness of the material is something very very important to uh, look at. So, in the specifications itself when you talk about uh, this expansion joints we should actually start talking about introducing a material at the expansion joint which is not just having high compressive strength, but at the same time having high bond strength uh, as mentioned here and at the same time toughness. I am going to write it here for some reason I missed it. Also toughness is also something very important to look at. So, in, in the long run uh, the, the system will perform uh, better without uh, much of uh, cracking. Uh, this is a similar uh, pictures again here we are talking still uh, impact and then additional parameters we have mentioned here low modulus of elasticity because uh, you know you want the material to uh, you know do not develop stress significant strength significant stress uh, even if the deformation is uh, more but within the uh, you know elastic range. So, it is very important to consider all these parameters when we talk about. So, we have a practice of just looking at only compressive strength when we talk about concrete. It is high time that we change it and we have to really think about what are the specific type of loading which is acting on the concrete material and how do we prevent uh, this kind of cracking or damage uh, you know uh, uh, provide that concrete which will have. Uh, ability to resist those kind of loads. In other words here if you are talking about impact load or fatigue load you have to have a material concrete should have high resistance against uh, the impact load and fatigue load. So, highly tough uh, concrete must be uh, used. Of course, turnaround is something very important turnaround time is very important especially when we talk about construction at uh, let us say you are talking about construction in a uh, uh, in a city center and uh, there where you really cannot close the traffic for long period of time. So, if you can if I can get let us say 6 hours of time from midnight till early morning when people are sleeping. So, we can actually get the construction done and by the time uh, you know the traffic uh, is on in the morning uh, the structure already has sufficient strength. Uh, you know, so rapid strength gain is very very important in such cases. Uh, so, special cement uh, has to be used so that the concrete can really gain strength um, and be a, uh, even the users will not even know that some repair were uh, done that is how it how good the work uh, should be. So, let us look at uh, one more property of uh, constructability which is flowability. In this case in the sketch shown here you can see that there is a foam work imagine this is the case of a beam repair uh, you have a foam work here and then you are pumping from the bottom. So, you pump like this this is the inlet you pump like this and then the the material is repair material is supposed to go in and then fill these spaces okay, inside the foam work. Now, this material if it has to really fill it up it has to be a flowable material and uh, not high I mean depending on the case you know sometimes you do not want too much flow. So, whatever is the required uh, uh, flow that has to be decided earlier and that much flow has to be uh, you know deliver I mean uh, the material should have uh, that required uh, flow properties. How can we achieve provide a material which is having high slum, but also at the same time with low segregation. I am going to write here high slum, low segregation. This is also a very, very important parameter and how do we usually achieve this? Use small aggregates, fines and round shape aggregates, so that the material flows uh, very well. Okay. 
and uh, in one more another property which is sometimes required is constructability without uh, you know there should not be significant sag in other words in such cases we usually go for a material which has high cohesive uh, forces or the material uh, you know uh, the cohesion is very high on and at the same time adhesion which is the bond between the repair material and the uh, uh, substrate is also very high. An example of this could be something where you know imagine a case where you have a roof and then you are actually doing the uh, you know uh, patch repair in the roof. Uh, so, where you need a material which will actually stick to the roof and work against the gravitational force. So, it has to uh, you know uh, that enter the dead weight of the mortar material itself uh, you know might be high, but it has to actually stick to the uh, existing substrate and so you need actually a material which has high cohesion and high uh, adhesive uh, bond between the uh, repair material and the uh, substrate. Now, one more thing I want to mention here is you know forgiving Murphy's law. Murphy's law you know that you know if something can go wrong it will go wrong that that is what is Murphy's law and uh, hence it is always better to go for a material which is relatively simpler ok. Simpler formulation uh, is uh, you know always better where uh, the dependency like you know if something uh, you know if, if you are depending on 5 different things for a material to perform one of them if it goes bad then maybe uh, the other 4 uh, will actually uh, help and uh, you know so this have to be thought through uh, and you know you have to think and may take you know all precautionary measures so that uh, things will not go wrong and your repair will uh, perform good again lastly appearance is also very important you see this repair here you know this all shrink uh, shrunk and uh, crack like uh, you know you can see very clearly map cracking so this particular region is now ready for removal. Uh, so, this is something happening be just because of the uh, drying shrinkage. So, what uh, to avoid this you have to. So, if this case when if you are when you are replacing you have to go for a material which is uh, highly resistant again drying shrinkage and uh, you know a sufficient flexibility. So, that it bends, but rather than getting cracked or in other words a ductile material would be better than a very uh, brittle material. And also uh, low exotherm that means in the early stages when the repair material has not uh, developed sufficient strength uh, you know there should be there should not be significant uh, thermal strains. Uh, so, it is always better to have a material which re reacts slowly and releases low heat in the beginning and uh, at the end you get a, a good product and water loss during placement basically the evaporation should be uh, prevented or in a plastic shrinkage is what we are talking there. Now, summary uh, we have to uh, look at different needs of the surface repair uh, and then how do we select first we have to look at bond with substrate is very very important to consider and load carrying capacity is very important to consider how or what are the different types of loads acting static load, uh, live load you know and also vibratory type or impact load all this have to be looked at fatigue all this have to be looked at and then make sure that the repair material uh, you know has sufficient ability to resist uh, such uh, loads. It is not only compressive strength which need to be looked at there are other types of uh, you know how the other parameters also should be looked at and dimensional stability mainly talking about shrinkage uh, either due to the chemical actions it themselves or due to the uh, you know uh, volume change due to uh, thermal effects or due to the loss of moisture or shrinkage. Um, and then also durability conditions is very very important because once the concrete or the repair material starts debonding or cracking then the definitely the uh, external elements will enter the concrete and then eventually leading to uh, corrosion. Now, constructability and appearance. 
So, let us say you have decided a material which has all these properties and but it is not easy to place that concrete then again it is not a good choice. So, we must think about how to place the concrete. So, think about the workers at site, their knowledge level, their uh, the workmanship available all this have to be thought through and then only we should select I mean the during the selection process that is something very very important to think about constructability and at the end user want the structure to look good. So, uh, the repair system should also be uh, able to provide a good appearance for the uh, structure. So, in uh, we uh, talked about user performance requirement, load carrying requirements and service and exposure conditions and also placement techniques while selecting the materials and also looked at different properties that are very important uh, for the uh, materials. Again let me emphasize two things, it is the properties when we talk about it is not the only strength. Uh, when I talk about only strength we talk about MX uh, type concrete let us say M20, M30 something like that M20 or M30. 40 something like this, but this is not sufficient, not sufficient. We have to think about now talking about MX DY type concretes and the DY is basically looking at the durability uh, you know parameters which will reflect the durability of the uh, concrete and D uh, you know uh, stands for durability here. So, whenever we talk about M something concrete we should also start thinking about MXDY concrete. I am introducing a new term here, but that is something very interesting and hope this will make us think a little bit more deep uh, into or uh, more deep when we think about selecting materials and thinking about various properties of the material. And this durability is not just talking about chloride ingress or carbonation, I am saying even fatigue resistance, even uh, toughness all these things which really lead to the long term performance of the uh, structural system uh, that is very important. And so, uh, we have to think about this MXDY concrete and D could be durability, D stands for durability and let us say long term performance, long term performance which sometimes like shrinkage, long term process, shrinkage, fatigue all those parameters uh, have to be looked at not just strength. I think that is the key point which I would like to state in this lecture that let us start thinking about MXDY concrete. Okay, to summarize I mean uh, these are the references which we uh, used uh, and thank you uh, for listening.